Good evening, everyone. It's a wonderful night for astronomy, and it's clear in Toronto, which is a change. It is our September Speakers Night for 2023. Welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. We are online tonight, and I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. So this is our Speakers Night presentation, starting up again after the uh, summer break. And please note that this meeting is online, an online-only presentation, so we are not at the Ontario Science Centre. Our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about various uh, programs later on this evening. But first, we have a very special event to kick off. So to start our broadcast, I'd like to just acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Massasaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. These lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Matisse, and Indigenous people from around Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here together, uh, we respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between the Indigenous peoples, the sky, and the earth. Now, for tonight's broadcast, we have a uh, fantastic speaker lined up. I'm very happy to announce we have Professor John Moores. So John E. Moores, you might have seen him around the RASC Toronto Centre before. He is the York Research Chair in Space Exploration from York University. He serves as a science advisor to the President of the Canadian Space Agency and has done quite a lot of outreach. Um, he uh, notoriously survived a department solar telescope, which I'm <laughs> looking forward to hearing that story maybe later. And he went on to study at the University of Toronto, later at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He got his PhD in planetary sciences in 2008. And Professor Moores is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars. He served on six space missions, uh, science operations teams, and the Cassie McCurdy uh, Award winner for 2022. He's dedicated to science outreach, and I understand his uh, book will actually be coming out in 2024. So uh, maybe talking about some of this fun stuff that he's done. I don't know. I can. <laughs> we'll have to wait for the book to see. So Professor Moore is, is here tonight to discuss Canada's uh, place in space and all kinds of interesting recent uh, upcoming projects and maybe discussion about uh, some of the ways that uh, space enthusiasts like ourselves can work together with governments and scientists. And I'm I'm really looking forward to this talk, so I'll just go ahead and say, uh, Dr. Morris, please go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Elena. And it's great to be back here uh, with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I love coming and visiting with you all and talking with you about space and just how exciting it is. So I've been a uh, York Research Chair for a while here, and I've been and, and a professor at York for about 10 years now. And it's my distinct pleasure to have been the science advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency now for just a little bit over a year. It's just amazing all of the things that we get to be part of internationally, this whole adventure of space science and, and exploration. And one of these projects, it's near and dear to my heart, and perhaps one that the room virtually knows quite well, is the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see a lovely image in the background of this title slide. This is uh, the one year anniversary image and it shows uh, star birth and star formation as it's never been seen before in the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud Complex. And really this is just the tip of the iceberg for Canada's involvement in space. So I wanna talk a little bit about space science and exploration generally, but also give that uh, Canadian perspective where I can. So what it comes down to um, is really, you know, I, I always remember this line, you know, how lucky we are to live in this time, the first moment in human history when we are, in fact, visiting other worlds. And this, of course, comes from Carl Sagan from his uh, miniseries Cosmos. And it just captures me, this particular way of thinking about our exploration of other worlds in the solar system, of exoplanets, and just thinking about all the, the wonders and the amazing things in the cosmos. We're in a time now where that discovery is happening lightning fast. Many of us have seen scenes like this. This particular one is from the double asteroid redirect test or the DART mission. And you know these, these types of celebrations, you see them all the time as we visit new places, we put up new missions, and we take a look at what's out there. 
Um, this particular mission was interested in taking a look at whether we could actually change something, specifically looking at uh, Dimorphos, which is a satellite of the asteroid Didymus. And there was a spacecraft that ran into it to see what would happen. It's uh, a little bit of a test for planetary defense, but it also teaches us a lot about science too. And so while that spacecraft had a trailing spacecraft looking at what was going on, we also took a look at the impact with Hubble and also with Webb. And you can see what happens here. It turns out that the asteroid was able to be changed just a little bit. So we got an idea of, of how to do that. But there are also these types of collisions that happen all the time in the asteroid belt. And so this gave us sort of a, a view of how that material gets ejected, how those bodies are changed by those types of impacts. And like many of the stories you'll hear tonight, it has a little bit of a Canadian connection to it as well. So the Hubble image is a little bit more zoomed out, the web image a little bit more zoomed in. And to capture an object like an asteroid, that spacecraft needs to be able to pivot very, very quickly. And luckily, we've got a Canadian contribution, the fine guidance sensors, which allowed the spacecraft to pivot three times as quickly as it was originally required to do so. And that allowed NASA to get this wonderful, wonderful movie that tells us an awful lot about what's going on on this particular body. So let me take a step back before I sort of dive in and, and think about you know, where we've been, you know, what is our exploration of you know, our near area in space, of our local laboratory, our neighborhood, uh, what does that look like? And, and I'd like to compare it to something historical. That's the age of European maritime discovery. Let's talk about that just very briefly here. So what I want you to, to go back and think about is a time when, from a European perspective, there had been no exploration of other parts of the world. So you're going back to 1502. There's been a few missions that have gone out, a few uh, voyages, but not a lot has gone on. And so the European understanding of the shape of the continents, you know, the seas and whatnot, is very poor. So if you take a look at the Cantino planisphere here, you're noticing that there are things that are completely absent. There's no North America, there's no Australia, there's not even Japan on there. And what happens is that over a period of a couple of hundred years, there were voyages that went out, voyages of exploration, and they went out for various reasons. So we have sort of that, that pure desire to make the unknown known, uh, such as missions like uh, the Matthew, uh, that's a ship by John Cabot, 1497, came to the east coast of Canada. But then we also have economic reasons as well. So I've got a second painting there, that's uh, the Half Moon, uh, which is Henry Hudson's ship. And you can see uh, that ship there uh, next to the island of Manhattan. It's only later that we find in this particular period that we get scientific driven exploration. And we have a very famous ship there as well. That's the Beagle in a painting by Conrad Martins. That uh, ship had a uh, very special passenger on board, uh, Charles Darwin, who was uh, there to actually do science. And something that I think is really wonderful about our modern area of exploration is that often we're putting that science first. It's the science which decides where we go next, what we want to understand, and what significance that has for us. But beyond these reasons, there, there's just that joy of, of getting out in the world, of exploring. And, and all human beings are explorers. We all have that inside of us. Anybody who has a toddler knows there's that innate desire to explore. And who knows what you're going to find when you go out there and explore. It could be anything. It could even be something like this. I mean, I'm not sure that, that I really want to be the knight in this particular picture there, but that's the amazing thing. You, you don't know until you go out and you see. And what happened with the uh, age of European maritime exploration is that gradually the explorers built up a better and better picture, at least of the shape of the continents and, and of the world. And a couple hundred years later, we get to the point where we have something like this. So this is the, uh, the new and correct map of the world from 1700 from John and Samuel Thornton. So what you notice here is that the map is much better. It's not perfect. Uh, the uh, east coast of Australia, a little bit strange. Not sure that the Great Lakes go quite that far into Canada. So there are still some errors here, but the shape of it, of things is much better known. 
So if we go back in time to what this looked like for the, uh, for the planets, here's what, we, uh, here's what we see. So before spacecraft, you've got this family portrait. So we had, uh, you know, this particular one is provided uh, courtesy of the, the York, uh, the Alan Carswell uh, Observatory at York University. But because of our atmosphere and the limitations that are introduced by that, it's about the best that we could do from any telescope on the ground. So what I've shown at the right there is Mount Palomar Observatory. And you can see that, that lovely family portrait there to the, to the left. Um, some of the planets we can see full on. Those are the ones that are further from us in the solar system. But those that are interior, Venus, Mercury, you only get slivers of them because they're always going to be closer to the sun than we are. And it has to do with, of course, our perspective in the, uh, in, in, in the universe. And even close to home, there are places that we just can't explore without spacecraft. The far side of the moon, for instance, we have to go there to see it. Doesn't matter how powerful a telescope you make here on the Earth, you'll never be able to do that. So you need exploration to see these places. Now that said, the knowledge that we had at the time was a little bit limited. Um, there are some pretty pictures that we get here. Um, I'm showing here the famous map that uh, Schiaparelli made of Mars, showing the infamous canals. Probably just uh, you know his, uh, his retinas in an unfocused telescope, but it really grabbed people's imagination. And you start to see um, very early on in looking at planets, these really amazing takes on them because the mind tries to fill in what's not there. Uh, I love the art of Etienne Leopold Trouvelot, where we have you know, Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. And then you see people uh, making sketches. So Jose Camasala you know, takes a look at Titan. Uh, H. McEwen takes a look at Jupiter. You, know, you see this, this amazing stuff. And really, it's about filling in those blanks. And if the telescopes can't show you and you can't tra yet travel with spacecraft, the mind does it for you. So we have this lovely image here on the left of the decline and fall of the Martian Empire. So this is a, an image uh, that was prepared, some artwork prepared by Kevin Zonley. And it's imagining those, uh, those canals as sort of the, the dying gasp of some Martian civilization desperately trying to pull water from the poles. Um, of course, these canals don't actually exist. And then on the right, I mean, Venus is great because Venus's clouds obscure the entire surface. So you could imagine anything was down there. And we have this truly incredible civilization here that uh, Frank Paul imagined in his artistry. So this is sort of where we were before we went out. And then starting in the late 1950s, we began the reconnaissance of the solar system. And what I'm showing in this particular image here is sort of a bit of an eye chart. So this is telling you about how many missions we've sent out to which places. And the number of lines that you see on this particular uh, image tell you about the number of missions. Um, this, by the way, is a wonderful infographic. Uh, it covers 58 to 2012, and it's called Cosmic Journey. It was prepared by Sean McNaughton, Samuel Velasco, um, Matthew Chambly and Jane Vessels, as well as NGM and Amanda Hobbs. So here you can see that the place we visited the most as of 2012 is the moon. Not surprising, it's our nearest, close, our nearest celestial neighbor. But we also have a number of missions to Mars, over here, sorry, to Venus, and fewer missions further out into the solar system, which is fairly typical because it's more difficult to visit those places that are further out it takes a longer time. You need a more robust spacecraft to do that than to visit places that are close. Uh, Mercury, interestingly enough, has seen very few missions as well because it turns out it's a hard place to get to as well, which is a little bit surprising. So in this particular graphic here, there are different colors for different space agencies. So we've got NASA in gold. We've got the Soviet Union and Russia in red, for instance, here. And you can see that those two colors dominate the map. But many other space agencies, many other countries have had a strong effect here as well. And something that um, isn't always well known is the idea that Canada actually was the third spacefaring nation in history. We are the third country to have put a satellite in orbit. And that satellite actually lasted a very long time. It was designed very robustly for its, uh, its period. 
and its data recently was digitized. So if you want to find out more, um, let me know after the fact. Let's imagine Canada specifically. Let's take a look at what contributions we've made here following that, uh, that wonderful first step. So um, what I'm showing here, these are places in the solar system where we've been able to have an impact to be part of the story, to be part of the narrative. So we have a lot of satellites that observe the Earth. Um, we call that at the agency space utilization. And I'm going to leave that aside for now and focus only on the exploration missions. So we do have some satellites at the Earth that look outward. Um, things like the Webb Space Telescope, for instance, which is actually a little further than the moon. But we've also done things at the moon. We've done things at an asteroid called Bennu. We've also visited Mars, and we've been to Jupiter and beyond. So I'm going to go ahead and put up all of the missions that we have been involved in one way, shape, or form in the next slide. Here we go. So just thinking about the Earth here, thinking about astronomy missions, low Earth orbit, looking out, there's actually been a number of these that we've, we've done. And what I've done here, they're in blue. Uh, the ones where we've led, where we've actually built the spacecraft and been the prime on the mission, um, we've got three of those with most Neosat Saturn Fuse. But there's a number of other missions I know you'll recognize to which we've played a smaller but, more, but even uh, a critical part. So stuff like Planck and Herschel, for instance. Webb, we have a big role in. We've got that fine guidance sensor, but also the nearest instrument that was developed by uh, the University of Montreal uh, is part of that mission. If we take a look to the moon, the moon, actually, we're going to be going back to in a big way. We've got uh, a whole program called LEAP. We've got the Artemis program that we're a big part of, Canadarm3, which will be on the Lunar Gateway, and our very own Canadian Lunar Rover, which you'll see later on in this decade. Um, I put Apollo up there as well because uh, a, a fun little uh, anecdote is that with Apollo, the uh, landing gear of the lunar module was actually contracted out to a company in Quebec. So in a sense, the first part of the Apollo missions to touch the moon was in a small way Canadian. So it's a fun point of pride. Um, at Mars, we've been busy. We've been part of a number of different missions in a number of different ways. Sometimes that contribution is primarily in science, like with the Trace Gas Orbiter, and sometimes we're involved with providing instruments, like with the Curiosity Rover or the Phoenix Lander. In other cases, it's our industry that are unparalleled in their ability to do certain technologies, and those technologies are in demand around the world. So you see things like camera technology that get incorporated into missions like Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity the InSight lander, Perseverance. And also, um, unfortunately, sometimes the missions don't work as well as we'd hope, such as the Japanese mission Nozomi, which uh, attempted to go into orbit around Mars, but it unfortunately didn't work out. Um, most recently, we've got Bennu. So the OSIRIS-REx mission, which I'll come back to later, um, has just been a triumph of Canadian technology. We have an instrument on there that was able to take a look at the asteroid and to map it in unprecedented detail. We actually know Bennu better uh, than we know any other body in the solar system, at least in terms of the number of points we've put across its surface. And we've played a smaller part in some of the bigger missions that you may have heard of as well. So things like Ulysses, Voyager 1 and 2. There are components to the hardware that were built and assembled and delivered from Canada. So Voyager 1 and 2 are actually, of course, headed out into interstellar space. There's a little bit of Canada headed out there as well. And no description of Canada's activities in space would be complete without thinking about the original Canadarm, which was on the space shuttle, Canadarm 2 and Dexter, which are on the uh, ISS. And we've had a number of different science experiments that have also flown on the ISS. So. It's clear, we've played a big part in space, in exploration, not just here at the Earth, but traveling beyond. How does that work? How do we coordinate with other spacefaring nations? You know, What's to keep everybody from launching the same mission with the same equipment to the same place at the same time? Well, we actually do some coordination here because there are a lot of players now and it's growing every year. So this slide comes from 2018. It comes from the Global Exploration Roadmap, which is a way that we actually talk to each other and coordinate. And there's even more agencies today. You know what? Looking at this image here, there's something that's not quite right. Let me see if I can fix it. 
That's right. We've got a new logo for the Canadian Space Agency, so I've, I've made a slight edit here. But with this map, you can see that there's participation from across the globe. Space exploration is truly a global enterprise. And as time goes on, more and more countries are getting into that game. Something that you see here in 2018 is there was no coordination. And in many cases, there were no space agencies in Africa, for instance. Whereas now there are a number of these new agencies that are just you know, taking their first steps into space exploration. And it's wonderful to see um, as everybody comes up together in this sort of peaceful cooperation. Um, where we get together to talk about these things, there is a couple of different methods. So agencies may get together and produce a document like the Global Exploration Roadmap, for instance, which you see in the center here. But those don't come from nowhere. We're informed by various stakeholder communities. That includes industry, that includes academics, and that includes the public. So for instance, if you look on the far left here, we've got the Canadian Astronomy Long Range Plan. So that's a document that's created by the Canadian astronomical community. And then we discuss the various plans, the various things that we could do in different forums. So the International Astronautical Congress, for instance, the IAC, that's one of the big ones. That one is a bit agency focused, but it's you know, really very much laser focused on exploration, a fascinating place. And then for a little bit more science, you could go to COSPAR, uh, which by the way, is the organization that is in charge of carrying out some of the scientific parts of the United Nations Outer Space Treaty, like planetary protection, for instance, falls under COSPAR's mandate. We also have other societies out there uh, of which the RASC would be one, but also places like the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute or CMOS or CASCA, so many different uh, places for us to have these conversations and decide collectively what's the best place to go next. In doing so, we create these things called roadmaps. And you know, again, a bit of an eye chart here, but the idea is that we have to come up with a plan. What missions are going to go where? Are they going to have human beings in them? Are they going to be robotic? You know, how do we put this together? So we imagine you know, this type of exploration as happening in a certain period of time and in different ways. So on this particular diagram here, we have Artemis 1 on crude, which uh, was successful not too long ago. And then we'll have Artemis 2, which is basically the same mission, but this time with human beings. And you sort of take these gradual steps where you build up your capability and what you can do. And this sort of forecasts where it goes. Now, this is a very technical document. I can show you the one, one from Mars as well. These, again, are from the Global Exploration Roadmap. And this shows you Mars sample return. Mars sample return doesn't happen with one mission. It happens with several and with several missions across several different space agencies. So there's a lot of coordination that has to happen for this to occur. The first part of this is already underway. We've got Mars 2020, also known as Perseverance. It's going out, it's collecting samples and putting them in tubes. And then later, the hope is that we will have another mission to retrieve those tubes, to bring them up into orbit, then to break the chain, just to make sure that the tubes are nice and clean, and then we come back to Earth with them. And that's expected to happen later this decade. Now, again, it's a bit of a complicated chart, but we need that kind of detail when we're putting together these, these missions. And, and I will admit, I do love nerding out with a chart like this, but it's important when we're talking about this stuff that we're able to bring the public along with us. And that's where uh, the agencies are really handy. So I love this particular picture here. This is uh, one of NASA's infographics. This is Journey to Mars. And you can see all of the different precursor missions, you know, how the science, the exploration, the technology all interweave to get us towards the goal that we have of understanding Mars a bit better, of exploring it, and eventually bringing some samples back to the Earth so that we can learn more about the stuff that makes up the place. I, I think it's really critical, this public aspect. And the role that I think organizations like the RASC can play in this is absolutely critical. Um, and part of this has to do with the fact that we've really come to, to care about our spacecraft, to really care about our exploration activities. I still remember you know, the Pathfinder mission in the late 90s and just the, the appetite from everyone for images, 
for the first time, images from Mars were being put on the web within hours of coming down. And it was amazing to see. And, and you see this, this thing entering our culture, really, this idea of exploration through these robotic avatars. And, and really, you know, there's a real emotion here. Um, the image that you're seeing here is actually a promotional photo from a documentary called Goodnight Oppie. And I recently watched Goodnight Oppie uh, with some friends, with 600 fourth graders. And, and let me tell you, I want to watch all my documentaries from this point forward with fourth graders because it's just, you can see on their faces, you know, the wonder and the emotion and the awe. They clap for uh, opportunities, successes. They cheered for them. And they cried at the end when the spacecraft, you know, essentially was, was done and, and couldn't communicate with the Earth anymore. There's really something that we can communicate, you know, something very human about this part of the exploration and the adventure of it. I love this selfie from the Curiosity rover, not just because I work on Curiosity, but I'm just, you know, there's something sublime here, thinking about these, these distant avatars you know, the excitement of doing science on Mars, but also the extreme sense of, of loneliness, of isolation in a picture like this. Here's a piece of the Earth, a robot, sitting out on a barren plane with nothing for hundreds of millions of kilometers. It's, you, you can't be more isolated than that. But just the, the wonder of the landscape is amazing. As we think about these types of spacecraft, I mean, they're just robots but they really are a piece of us. And we like to make stories about them just the same way that we made stories about what was lying beneath those clouds on Venus. Uh, this is one of my favorites from the Phoenix Lander. There was a, an external group of people who created this idea of Steve the cat, you know, who was traveling you know, within the, the, the Mars Lander. And you know, they, they have these wonderful tales that they tell about this. Don't worry, uh, even though Phoenix didn't come back, Steve did return safely back to the Earth uh, at the end of the, the story there. But it's, it's just amazing to see this, this come about. And it's not just with things like you know, rovers that might remind you of, of a Pixar movie like WALL-E. It's also with other spacecraft that are perhaps not as amenable to, uh, to thinking of them as, as human, you know, not so anthropomorphized. So here's, here's an image I love from Cassini from the, the late 90s as well, imagining all of the different spacecraft, in, uh, spacecraft um, instruments and thinking about the engines and the computers and whatnot in anthropomorphic terms, like the brains, the skeleton, the eyes, you know, the dancing legs and the walking legs. That's my favorite part, I have to say. Uh, Two-way communication with a telephone. Oh, my. Back in the days before smartphones. So it's really fascinating uh, to see this kind of way of, of trying to connect. And it's something that, you know, we really develop a strong connection to. So I'm going to play you a short little video here um, at the very end of, of Cassini. And I'm just going to advance it a little bit up to about here. So one thing I, I would definitely hazard just looking at this video myself is that there's no spacecraft that has ever had as good a view as Cassini did during its grand finale. So at this point in the Cassini mission, what was happening was that Cassini was actually diving in between the planet and the ring plane. So before that, the spacecraft had stayed well away, you know, safe from all of those particles that could have damaged it. But it was coming to the end of its life. It was time to do something really, really spectacular. And, and we can't help but imagine the scene in our mind's eye. And that's really what the animators have done here, is they've, they've imagined what it would look like to ride along with a Cassini spacecraft. They've answered that question in their minds, what it would be like to actually be there, to see those ring particles, to see those clouds, to see them up close. It'd be amazing. But Unfortunately, um, a journey so close to, to Saturn, it can't last forever. And eventually Cassini did complete its voyage, diving into Saturn's atmosphere, and it became a meteor, as you see here in its skies. It became two tons of terrestrial materials fashioned by human hands and now forever, uh, basically a part of uh, the jewel of the solar system. 
So after this, after you, you know, it, it's dis disintegrated entirely here. Um, what's interesting to me is really now all that material gets mixed with Saturn's clouds. And so whenever you look at Saturn in the skies, it's true that a small piece of what you're seeing is something that's tied to our own home. A tiny, tiny fraction of those solar photons that you see scattered towards your eyes are reflected off of earthly atoms now. But as poetic as it all is, we really do miss these spacecraft when they're gone. There's, there's real emotion there. And at its core, space exploration, even robotic exploration, is a truly human endeavor. So let me talk a little bit about Canada's part in this, you know, and the future of, of Canadian exploration. So there's going to be a couple of different things I, I talk about here. Of course, there's a lot happening at the moon. We're thinking about Mars. And we've got Webb, and we've also got, you know, some really, really fascinating stuff coming up just this next week from Bennu. And with this graphic here, you can see sort of starting at our own home, going on to the moon, and imagining then going on towards Mars um, at the far distance. Uh, so I love this, this Canadian lens, this Canadian window on space exploration here. So the first big thing, I think, to mention has got to be the Lunar Gateway. So the Lunar Gateway is a small station. It's going to orbit the moon. So not as big as the ISS, but in a very interesting uh, place. In, in fact, it's only about one sixth the size of the International Space Station. There's going to be some modules here for science research. There's going to be living quarters for crews of up to four astronauts. And it's something that's done in a partnership with a number of different space agencies, primarily NASA, but we're big uh, you know, contributors to this particular mission as well. So we're going to have a large contribution here, and that is called Canadarm3, which is currently scheduled to launch in 2027. This particular station, it's going to be a science laboratory. It's going to be a test bed for new technologies, but it's also going to be a bit of a rendezvous location for missions going on to explore the surface of the moon and a bit of a mission control center for operations on the moon itself without that light time delay that you get between the Earth and the moon. And maybe someday, a stepping stone for voyages on to Mars. I've got a little video here of Canadarm3 um, that I can show you. Oh, sorry. Um, so much as the previous uh, Canadarms, it's going to be a robotic system that's going to perform some tasks on the Lunar Gateway, but this time without some human intervention. We're going to get some artificial intelligence involved here. Uh, but for very critical tasks, there will be robotic flight controllers in Canada or on the Gateway crew who can help out as well. So like with Canada Arm 2 and Canada Arm 1, it's going to be responsible for maintaining, repairing, inspecting things on the Lunar Gateway, for capturing other vehicles, for relocating Gateway modules, and helping astronauts during spacewalks, and doing a little bit of science too. So here's the video that I've got here. I'll go ahead and uh, play this one for you so you can see um, Canada Arm 3 and Lunar Gateway in, uh, in action here. So you can see the moon off to the right there. It's, of course, much bigger than the Earth is. And um, what you've got here for Canada Arm 3 is you've got a large arm and a small agile arm that's going to do that transfer of mission critical material between the exterior and the interior of the space station. And you can actually have the one repair the other. Uh, it's a really, really creative system, I think. Um, there's going to be tools. Uh, it's going to be able to travel the entire length of the Lunar Gateway, moving end over end with anchoring hands. And in exchange for providing this capability to the station, we get opportunities for science on the moon's surface, in lunar orbit, technology demonstrations, commercial activities, and two astronaut flights to the moon which is really, really exciting. So that part of this is called Artemis. That's the human side of our exploration of the moon coming up. And really, it, it, it's just so exciting, I, I have to say. Um, we had the, uh, the selection not too long ago of a Canadian astronaut for Artemis II. That would be Jeremy Hansen. And you can see him there on the right. Um, very, very proud to see that maple leaf on his, uh, his left shoulder there. And uh, Jeremy really is going to write history as part of the new generation of space explorers. 
Uh, there's only been 24 humans who've seen that complete blue marble of the Earth from space. And now Jeremy is going to be added to that list. And as a result, Canada is going to become the second country to ever send an astronaut around the moon. So once uh, we have Artemis II completed, we're going to essentially have a Canadian who's traveled further than anyone who's not a, you know, a, a citizen of the United States. To give you a little bit more about the Artemis mission, um, I'll do a little bit of, uh, of description here. So we've got sort of three that are on the books right now. Artemis I, which is completed. That was an uncrewed test flight to make sure that the hardware was in good shape. Artemis II will be with a crew to see how they work with this hardware. And then Artemis III, that's when you start going down to the lunar surface. So that's sort of the, uh, the idea here. So the thought with Artemis II is that this could be coming up as soon as 2024. You know, right now the plan, I believe, is for fall of 24. And then Artemis III would be no earlier than 2025. So that will be really, really exciting, I think, in the next few years. And uh, I have an animation here of exactly what the, uh, the Artemis I and II missions would look like. They're very similar. It's just that one is uncrewed and another has a human crew in it. So let me show you what that looks like. So the first part here is launch, of course. So we've got an Orion spacecraft launching from Kennedy Space Center in Florida on this space launch system rocket. And that takes the spacecraft out towards the moon. That travel, that outbound trip takes several days, just the same as it did during the Apollo era. And as it's traveling, those solar panels deploy at the start of the flight so that you can get some power. Now, we have an engine burn that puts you into that uh, lunar orbit or that translunar orbit. And then there is gonna be a coasting phase before any, any corrections to the trajectory are, are made only if needed, of course. Um, you have an injection burn into lunar orbit, and eventually you go back around to the Earth. Um, right now, the plan is for about six days in orbit around the moon to assess the spacecraft's performance. And then about three weeks total after launch, you have the spacecraft coming back to Earth and safely landing um, you know, on the Earth's surface. So you know, it's a fairly recognizable mission profile, I think. But we haven't seen anything like this in decades. So it, it's really exciting to see this, uh, this coming up, I have to say. Now, ahead of all of that, we also have some neat little science and technology activities. So we have a program called LEAP, which is the Lunar Exploration Acceleration Program. And that funds activities in artificial intelligence and robotics and health. It funds um, all sorts of different activities that get us ready for what we want to do at the moon. And it funds a lot of science as well. We also have an initiative going on to help us start to think about how we operate and how we work in these kinds of, of very, very distant places. So one of the most important challenges here is keeping astronauts safe and healthy when they're so far away from resources. You, you can imagine if there's a problem, you can't just fly back to Earth, at least not easily, and that will take days, even if the capability is there. So these astronauts, they're going to have very limited access to healthcare providers, to medical resources. And there are, in fact, these challenges are not that dissimilar from what some remote communities face here in the Earth. So there's the potential to take what we learned from this and to bring it back. So. Uh, this is the Health Beyond initiative. We also have, and I'm really excited about this, a Canadian lunar rover. So this is a technology demonstration that's going to do some really, really neat science. And this rover is going to go to the moon within the next five years. It's going to last over lunar night, which is 14 days of the most bitter cold you can imagine and darkness. And uh, hopefully it'll go to the moon's southern pole. Maybe you'll even see some water ice there. And of course, that water ice can be used as fuel. It can be used as uh, you know, water to drink. It can be used as, as oxygen to breathe, as well as the inherent scientific value of looking at that kind of water. We also have another project called the, uh, the Narvik Project, uh, which is thinking about food availability in deep space. So here, 
uh, we've got um, this set of uh, shipping containers that are located in a community 250 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. And they're powered by renewable resources, wind and solar, and are able to grow fresh food all year round. It's part of a bigger sort of uh, project called the Deep Space Food Challenge. So this is a place where we're collaborating with NASA, trying to find good technologies to produce sort of tasty and nutritious food with minimal resources. Um, you know, you don't want everything to be dehydrated on these long missions. You want to have the, the astronauts know the, you know, the joy and the remembrance of home with having this kind of fresh food. And of course, not only useful for long duration space missions, but also we can feed that back into remote communities as well. Now, James Webb, I, I can't stop without, you know, giving one more tip of the hat to this wonderful, wonderful mission of which we're a big part. You can see the CSA logo um, really highlighted on the side of the Ariane space rocket there. And of course, this was many, many years in the making. Once it, you know, got uh, out to the, uh, to its uh, Lagrange point, um, there was the trepidation with, you know, unfolding everything, but everything went well. And the results that it's gotten so far have been nothing short of, of revolutionary. It's been an amazing, amazing mission and will continue to be for many years to come, hopefully lasting as long as Hubble has, uh, has lasted or even longer. Uh, finally, um, again, you know, thinking about how do we support astronauts in these places? That's always a, a challenge. So bringing together all of those different components so that we can think about exploring the moon and then use that as a kind of a practice for exploring a place like Mars. So I just wanna leave you with a couple of things. So we're a trusted partner in deep space equipment. We've done a lot of missions, as I've shown you earlier, with a lot of different partners. And a really, really spectacular one has been this OSIRIS-REx mission, which is our first participation in asteroid sample return. So we had a laser altimeter on OSIRIS-REx uh, called OLA, and it took the most detailed 3D measurements of any celestial body ever explored. Uh, this mission is going to help us to unlock some of the most fundamental questions about the formation of our own solar system and the origins of life on Earth, we hope. The key to this is the sample, and OLA allowed the team to pick a really good spot for a sample, and they got a really nice um, you know, bit of material from this pristine body from the earliest part of the solar system. This is basically an ingredient into, uh, I'm sorry, out of which all of the planets were, were created. And this sample is coming back soon. It's touching down in the Utah desert in four days on September the 24th. So that'll be on NASA TV, take a look for it. Canada actually gets a chunk of this sample. We get 4% that's going to be curated at the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in Saint-Hubert, Quebec. And so that will then be loaned out to Canadian scientists to run uh, tests on it, to really you know, sort of understand about the materials from which the planets and our solar system formed. So kind of to sum up here, these are really exciting times for space exploration and especially for Canada. We've got this new era of lunar exploration that's coming up. It's going to provide opportunities for companies, for researchers and, you know, for the public to get excited about space and to really, you know, help us to, to you know, humanize the whole endeavor. Uh, we've got great innovations that we expect are going to come back and, and help with life on Earth, cutting edge technologies that will be de developed and world leading science in which we're deeply involved. The Canadian community is not sitting on the wings here. We're in the center of the show. And of course, these upcoming missions to new destinations are likely to inspire young Canadians to really reach for those stars and become the next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers that uh, we need to see out there helping us um, in the great beyond. So with that, thank you very much for having me. Um, if you'd like to follow the CSA, there is uh, a lot of social media out there. Our website is on this list. And thank you so much for having me here to talk with you tonight. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Morris. As, uh, as you say, it is a very exciting time in, in astronomy. Uh, discovery and exploration are just such wonderful ideas to share in. And I'm sure there's a lot of RASC members tonight who um, have been happy to join in the excitement of so many missions. And especially, as you say, having our new Canadian astronaut, Jeremy Hansen, um, going up soon. And of course, even sooner, fingers crossed for that Bennu sample return in four days. Uh, really exciting stuff. So we have a few questions coming your way from YouTube, and I'm going to send you over to Emma for questions now. Uh, so we'll pass it over to Emma. Hi, yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, we got a few questions in from the YouTube. The first one is, uh, will, the Q will the crew of Artemis II be the same as the crew of Artemis III? No, there'll be a different crew that'll be selected later on is, is the expectation here. Cool, thank you. Um, which do you think is the most important paragraph, to photo, sorry, which do you think is the most important photograph to come out of the James Webb Space Telescope to date? Oh my, you know, how to pick, how to pick, right? Um, <laughs> it's like choosing between you know, your, your, your children. Oh goodness, um, I do love that, that first year anniversary photo. I mean, it just looks so painterly. It, it, it doesn't, it do, almost doesn't look real. So that one's amazing. Oh, there's just so many great examples of, of, of different ones. I just love scrolling through them. So I, I'd encourage anyone out there listening along to go over to the, the JWST website and, and take a look at some for yourself. They're just, they're all amazing. That's really cool. Um, another question. As science advisor to the president, do you get to work on any of these upcoming projects? And if so, which ones? Well, it, it, it's kind of fun, right? Because... Um, you know, my job is to sort of, you know, bring science to that, uh, that, that, that table at the CSA and to, to speak for science. So while I'm not working on any of these missions directly, I'm trying to reflect the view that the scientists in the community, um, the people who are actually working on the mission have, and to make sure that we, you know, enable them to do the best possible science that we can. Um, but it, it, it's true. I would love to work on every single mission. There's just so much exciting stuff at the agency right now. That's true, yeah, it's all very exciting. Um, the next question is, which do you think is the most important space mission to date? Oh my, <laughs> we've got a lot of choosing between our, 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 our distinguished children here. Um, I feel like I, I, I've, I, of course, have to, you know, my, my, my heart always goes out to Curiosity and to uh, Phoenix because those are missions I worked on personally. Um, the Huygens probe, uh, you know, there wasn't a Canadian contribution to that one. I did that while I was in grad school, and that there's just something special about the Saturnian system, I have to say. And and that was a mission, the Huygens probe, that really sort of ignited the, the exploration bug in me. Because I remember, I still remember that night, you know, when the, the images were coming back from Titan. I mean, with a six hour delay, it was it was crazy. And you know, you're going down through the atmosphere and you see, you know, clouds, clouds, and then you know, kind of a fuzzy surface. And then all of a sudden, you know, bang, you're on the surface and you've got this human scale view looking out over this plane, you know, incredibly impossibly far from, from the earth and, and just seeing that scene. And, and what was interesting, you know, an interesting part of it, you know, we were, so many of us were, were just like, you know, stopped in our tracks staring at this. But then I started noticing people, you know, counting off and they're trying to figure out who was the first person to see the, uh, the surface of Titan. And, you know, I don't think it was me, but, but I'm somewhere in the top 12 there. And it's just, I, I've, I've just loved that ever since. The idea of seeing a landscape that's, you know, exotic, you know, it's on Titan and, and the surface is made of water ice stones, but it's kind of, um, it, it's identifiable, it's relatable on a human scale. And I've always enjoyed that, that intersection of, uh, of those things. In, in the work that I do, uh, in the science I do, and in the advice that I, I give when I'm at the, the space agency. That's, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> um, we got a question from Tom who wants to know, do you think there will be any delay in Artemis missions two and three? Hmm. I mean, this is of course space exploration. We're never going to do anything until we're you know confident that we can do it properly. And that we have everything, you know, every um, possible thing figured out. So, um, I, you know, like with anything, 
there can be delays, but I'm not aware of any delays myself. That's, yeah, that makes sense. Um, this next question is, uh, do Canadian geologists get a portion of the Bennu samples and has it been decided who gets what? Ah, so there, uh, Canadian geologists will have the opportunity to study the Bennu samples. Uh, they're going to be stored, um, or, or a portion, Canada's portion, which is 4% of the mass. That'll be stored uh, at the Canadian Space Agency. And the hope is to distribute that widely. And the idea there is that, you know, we can do various different tests in different facilities, um, you know, over a long period of time that this will be something that, you know, adds value to the scientific community for many, many years to come. And the hope is that that everybody who wants to work with this, you know, potentially can get the chance to do that. They simply have to, you know, we haven't put in, in place the procedure for how that would happen. But the idea is not to restrict it to uh, to anyone or, you know, that, that it all belongs to Professor X or Professor Y. It's meant to be a resource and uh, really a treasure for the whole country. Now, you said that's 4%. Um... You might not know off the top of your head, but uh, what is that in grams? It's not a lot of grams. Um, I believe that it's it's somewhere between you know single digits and low double digits of grams. Part of it is that we don't know the exact amount of sample that Venue collected. We have a, a bit of a range there as, as well. So until that comes back um, in four days, oh my, and and then. You know, we, we crack open the container, uh, not on the desert in Utah. It goes to a, a nice, you know, clean facility first. But once you open it up, then we'll see how much is in there. And then, you know, 4% of that comes to Canada. And the science team gets some of that sample as well. And some of the science team are Canadians. So there is potential for maybe even a little bit more to wind up, you know, north of the 49th parallel. Oh, that's great. Um, this is, I believe, our last question. Are there any independent Canadian rocket startups or universities designing satellites for exploration? So there, there's definitely universities that are developing small satellites. Uh, there are plenty of universities who've done CubeSats. There's actually student teams who've done CubeSats. And an area of exploration that's growing is the idea of taking those kinds of space mission architectures and deploying them in other places. So there's no reason you couldn't hitch a ride, say, on a mission. Sorry, sorry. Um, there, there's no reason that uh, you you couldn't um, that, that that you couldn't you know take a ride on a, another um, an, another mission going to Mars or to Jupiter or or somewhere else like that. And then those types of, of things um, you can bring with them. Sorry, you can bring with you those other locations. So, you know, with with that, um, I, I think we've got a history in the country of developing some really robust um, satellite technology that could survive those kinds of journeys. And we've got a, a really good niche, I think, in building sort of smaller things going all the way back to the uh, the most space telescope. So, you know, it, it's an exciting possibility of going and, and doing that kind of exploration. That's very cool. Um, that was our last question. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it back to Elena. All right. Well, thank you once again. Um, it's been uh, great to hear that I can also apply to get a piece of Bennu if I want to and <laughs> lots of other wonderful things as well. And thank you for mentioning uh, the, the satellites for any students in Canada, of course, um, I know that there's a lot of different SEDS programs and uh, there's just so much excitement going on. It's, it's, um, I think it's gonna lead to a lot of wonderful discussions, especially about which space mission actually was the best. Was it Huygens? Was it Phoenix? Um, so I look forward to reading all that on YouTube chat later. <laughs> and uh, thank you once again for tonight, uh, Dr. Moores. We're going to go ahead and with that, hand off to the president of the Toronto Centre, RASC, Tom Luton to finish off the evening. Over to you, Tom. All right. Well, thank you very much, Elena, and thank you very much to our speaker for a wonderful presentation. Good evening, everybody watching us live on YouTube, and uh, let us get right into the announcements.
So uh, this is one of two types of meetings that we have here on YouTube uh, or, at, or uh, live at the Ontario Science Centre. Um, you've just seen one of our speakers nights and in the in a couple of weeks, we're going to be having one of our recreational astronomy nights, which is both live and in person at the Ontario Science Centre. If you're watching us live on YouTube uh, for either of our types of meetings, please say hello in the chat. Uh, enter some questions for presenters. Uh, if you're a new member, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, uh, please uh, let us know where you're coming from. So our next recreational astronomy night is on Wednesday, October the 4th, 7.30 p.m. As I said, uh, both in person at the Ontario Science Center and online as well. We've got a full slate. Dennis Gray will be discussing the sky this month. Clay Davies will be talking about amazing, an amazing telescope that you can build, an 8-inch F8 Dobsonian. Ed Trace will be uh, talking about our uh, giving us an update on the Long Branch uh, uh, site and planetary puzzles. And then we'll be having a group presentation, Mehdi bozo -Ray, Martin Labartet, and Claire gong Minier. and I apologize, I've I know I've goofed those names in some way. Uh, we'll be talking about high school astronomy from JWST data processing to amateur spectroscopy. Uh, this is uh, online only uh, here live on YouTube. Um, uh, if you'd like to present something, uh, please contact Paul Markov. Coming up on Wednesday, the 18th of October, 7.30 p.m. online. Uh, Professor Margaret Campbell Brown from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at uh, Western will be talking about when worlds collide, asteroids, comets, and the Earth. Online here at YouTube. Now for some bad news. I regret to announce that we have been unable to make our schedules work with availability of the DDO uh, bookings. And as a result, I'm sorry that officially the 2023 awards picnic has been canceled. Um, so I'm the president, and so I take responsibility for this, and I apologize. Uh, what is going on? Coming up on the 22nd, the this Friday, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. at Millennium Square in uh, Pickering, is uh, our Millennium Square public stargazing session. Uh, join us for an evening of free public stargazing along the north shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, take a look at the moon and stars through our telescopes. You can check out our astronomy literature, ask us some questions, and uh, we will show you the stars and planets. And if you bring your own telescope, we'll be happy to give you a hand setting it up and aiming it at the moon. Remember to dress for cooler temperatures down by the lake, and we are recommending wearing of masks and the use of hand disinfectants uh, for our info booth. Please check out our website for a go, no go decision based on the weather before heading down to the square. Coming up at the David Dunlop Observatory over the next few weeks, uh, Planetarium Day is Saturday, September the 23rd from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and a second session between 2.45 and 4.15 p.m. Registration fee is uh, fifteen sixty nine for under the age for under sorry under the age of fifteen for fifteen and up it's seventeen seventy two. Uh, you'll have to register online. The links can be found at rasco.ca. Uh, Astronomy Speakers Night at the DDO that on the evening of uh, September twenty third, eight p.m. to ten p.m. Connor Hayes will be discussing Curiosity's Got Its Head in the Clouds, 11 Years of Cloud Observation from Gale Crater on Mars. Uh, fees and uh, are as before. And again, links to register online can be found at rasco.ca. Coming up on Sunday, September the 24th, 12.30 uh, p.m. is Sunday Sun Gazing. Um, Again, fees and links can be found at rasto.ca. And then a free event without registration, the first clear night of September 25th to 29th at sunset is DDO Stargazing. Uh, bring your own binoculars. So 
as I said, the first clear night of the 25th to the 29th. And then another uh, Astronomy Speakers Night at the DDO on the 29th of September, 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., Quentin Weyrick will be talking about taking back the night sky, what we can do about light pollution. As before, fees are listed here, and to register online, you can find the links at rasktio.ca. At the Ontario Science Center on Saturday, the 7th of October at 10 a.m. is solar observing. Uh, RaskTO volunteers will be set up in the front of the building and offering views of, through the sun, of the sun through filtered telescopes. Uh, this is a weather dependent event, so please check our website for the go, no go call prior to attending. And the big news, Saturday, October 14th, from 11.30 to 2.30 p.m. is the solar eclipse. Now, um, this is going to be different from last time. If you were there in 2017, you remember the absolutely enormous crowd. The Science Center is trying to prevent a similar-sized event uh, for safety reasons. What this means is that they are moving the eclipse viewing into the... Uh, science Center grounds. It's going to be uh, set up on the Level 3 Terrace, uh, which means that if you're not volunteering, you will have to pay the admission fee. Uh, for that end, we're also looking for some volunteers to assist. We're looking for a total of about 10 folks with solar scopes, plus another five folks to help out, uh, to talk to folks and to relieve scope owners uh, when they take breaks. Uh, contact myself, president at rasto.ca, if you would like to help. The CAO is still open. Uh, the snow has not yet started to fly up north. So uh, operations are largely back to pre-pandemic conditions, but with a few exceptions. Uh, that being that uh, we're having a maximum of two unrelated persons per bedroom uh, who mutually agree to share that space. And masking in common areas, areas is encouraged, but uh, preferences will be by those who are in attendance. Uh, public outreach um, and supervised weekends through the summer and fall have resumed. If you'd like to visit uh, and are a member, please uh, visit the CAO bookings page for details, details and please read everything before you make your uh, booking. We're still looking to fill a few spots on our job board. The volu a volunteer committee chair, a marketing committee chair, and, a com and some committee members, and the education and public outreach uh, committee is always looking for additional presenters as well as telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Reminder, if you'd like to volunteer, you first must be a member. Um, contact myself, president at rasto.ca to help, if you'd like to help. Um, this is the part where I get to plug uh, RASC membership. Uh, you can renew or sign up online at secure.rasc.ca. Uh, gift memberships are available through the national office at mempub at rask.ca. So uh, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media we've got listed here. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe and click the notifi notification bell. Uh, be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everyone.